The Glass Castle, pages 285 to 288. Part 5, Thanksgiving. I was standing on the platform with my second husband, John. A whistle sounded in the distance, red lights flashed, and a bell clanged as the gates were lowered across the roadway. The whistle sounded again, and then the train appeared around the bend through the trees and rumbled toward the station, its massive twin headlights pale in the bright November afternoon. The train eased to a stop. The electric engines hummed and vibrated, and after a long pause, the doors opened. Passengers spilled out, carrying their folded newspapers and canvas weekend bags and brightly colored coats. Through the crowd, I saw Mom and Lori getting out of the back of the train, and I waved. It had been five years since Dad died. I had seen Mom only sporadically since then, and she'd never met John nor been to the old country farmhouse we bought the year before. It had been John's idea to invite her and Lori and Brian out to the house for Thanksgiving, the first Wallace family get-together since Dad's funeral. Mom broke into a huge smile and started hurrying towards us. Instead of an overcoat, she was wearing what looked to be about four sweaters and a shawl, a pair of corduroy trousers and some old sneakers. She carried bulky shopping bags in both hands. Lori behind her wore a black cape and a black fedora. They made quite a pair. Mom hugged me. Her long hair was mostly gray, but her cheeks were rosy and her eyes were as bright as ever. Then Lori hugged me and I introduced John. Excuse my attire, Mom said, but I plan to change out of my comfy shoes into some dress shoes for dinner. She reached into one of her shopping bags and pulled out a pair of banged up penny loafers. The winding road back to the house led under stone bridges through woods and villages and past marsh ponds where swans floated on mirror-like water. Most of the leaves had fallen and gusts of wind sent them spiraling along the roadside. Through the thickets of bare trees, you could see the houses that were invisible during the summer. As he drove, John told Mom and Lori about the area, about the duck farms and the flower farms and the Indian origin of our town's name. Sitting beside him, I studied his profile and couldn't help smiling. John wrote books and magazine articles. Like me, he had moved around a lot while growing up, but his mother had been raised in an Appalachian village in Tennessee, about 100 miles southwest of Welch, so you couldn't say our families hailed from the same neck of the woods. I'd never met a man I would rather spend time with. I loved him for all sorts of reasons. He cooked without recipes. He wrote nonsense poems for his nieces. His large, warm family had accepted me as one of their own. And when I first showed him my scar, he said it was interesting. He used the word textured. He said smooth was boring, but textured was interesting. And the scar meant that I was stronger than whatever it was that had tried to hurt me. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. We pulled into the drive. Jessica, John's 15-year-old daughter from his first marriage, came out of the house along with Brian and his 8-year-old daughter, Veronica, and their bull mastiff, Charlie. Brian hadn't seen much of Mom since Dad's funeral either. He hugged her and immediately started ribbing her about her plucked-from-the-dumpster presents she brought for everyone in the shopping bags. Rusting silverware, old books and magazines, a few pieces of fine bone china from the 20s with only minor chips. Brian had become a decorated sergeant detective, supervising a special unit that investigated organized crime. He and his wife had split up around the time Eric and I did, but he had consoled himself by buying and renovating a wreck of a townhouse in Brooklyn. He put in new wiring and plumbing, a new firebox, reinforced floor joints, and a new porch all on his own. It was the second time he'd taken on a true dump and restored it to perfection. Also, at least two women were after him to marry them. He was doing pretty darn well. We showed Mom and Lori the gardens, which were ready for winter. John and I had done all the work ourselves, raked the leaves and shredded them in the chipper, cut back the dead perennials and mulched the beds, shoveled compost onto the vegetable garden and tilled it, and dug up the dahlia bulbs and stored them in a bucket of sand in the basement. John had also split and stacked the wood from a dead maple we cut down and climbed up to the roof to replace some rotted cedar shingles. Mom nodded at all our preparations. She'd always appreciated self-sufficiency. She admired the wisteria that wrapped around the potting shed, the trumpet vine on the arbor, the big grove of bamboo in the back. When she saw the pool, an impulse seized her, and she ran out onto the green plastic cover to test its strength, Charlie the dog lopping after her. 
The cover sagged beneath them, and she fell down, shrieking with laughter. John and Brian had to pull her off as Brian's daughter, Veronica, who hadn't seen Mom since she was a toddler, stared wide-eyed. Grandma Walls is different from your other grandma, I told her. Way different, Veronica said. John's daughter, Jessica, turned to me and said, but she laughs just like you do. I showed Mom and Lori the house. I still went into the office in the city once a week, but this was where John and I lived and worked, our home, the first house I'd ever owned. Mom and Lori admired the wide planks floorboards, the big fireplaces, and the ceiling beams made from locust posts, with gouge marks from the axe that had felled them. Mom's eyes settled on an Egyptian couch we'd bought at a flea market. It had carved legs and a wooden backrest inlaid with mother-of-pearl triangles. She nodded in approval. Every household, she said, needs one piece of furniture in really bad taste. The kitchen was filled with the smell of roasting turkey John had prepared, with a stuffing of sausage, mushrooms, walnuts, apples, and spiced breadcrumbs. He also made creamed onions, wild rice, cranberry sauce, and squash casserole. I baked three pies with apples from the nearby orchard. Bonanza, Brian shouted. Feast time, I said to him. He looked at the dishes. I knew what he was thinking, what he had thought every time he saw a spread like this one. He shook his head and said, you know, it's not really hard to put food on the table if that's what you decide to do. Now, no recriminations, Lori told him. After we sat down for dinner, Mom told us her good news. She had been a squatter for almost 15 years, and the city had finally decided to sell the apartments to her and the other squatters for a dollar apiece. She couldn't accept our invitation to stay a while, she said, because she had to go back for a board meeting of the squatters. Mom also said she'd been in touch with Maureen, who was still living in California, and that our kid sister, whom I had spoken to since she left New York, was thinking of coming back for a visit. We started talking about some of Dad's great escapades, letting me pet the cheetah, taking us demon hunting, and giving us stars for Christmas. We should drink a toast to Rex, John said. Mom stared at the ceiling, miming perplexed thought. I've got it. She held up her glass. Life with your father was never boring. We raised our glasses. I could almost hear Dad chuckling at Mom's comment in the way he always did when he was truly enjoying something. It had grown dark outside. A wind picked up, rattling the windows, and the candle flame suddenly shifted, dancing along the border between turbulence and order. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. Be sure that you have completed your table of contents for this section.